this will be the first of a series of videos for the, the Philosophers in Their Own Words playlist, in which we explore some passages from David Hume's inquiry concerning human understanding. And specifically, we'll be looking at section 4, which is about doubts concerning the operations of the understanding. And section 5, the skeptical solution of these doubts. A solution to the doubts, but a skeptical solution. We will no doubt later discuss exactly what this skepticism uh, means in this context, but let us begin at the beginning. Section 5, David Hume's Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. All the objects of human reason or inquiry may naturally be divided into two kinds. And these two kinds are relations of ideas and matters of fact. Of the first kind are the sciences of geometry, algebra, and arithmetic, and in short, every affirmation which is either intuitively or demonstratively certain. Hume now gives two examples. One is the Pythagorean theorem. Another is uh, 3 times 5 equals half of 30. And then he says propositions of this kind are discoverable by the mere operation of thought without dependence on what is anywhere existent in the universe. Skipping just one sentence, he goes to matters of fact and says, matters of fact, which are the second object of human reason, are not ascertained in the same manner, nor is our evidence of their truth, however great, of a like nature with the foregoing. The contrary of every matter of fact is still possible because it can never imply a contradiction and is conceived by the mind with the same facility and distinctness as if ever so conformable to reality. That the sun will not rise tomorrow is no less intelligible a proposition and implies no more contradiction than the affirmation that it will rise. So, here, here Hume has divided human knowledge into two categories, relations of ideas and matters of fact. And he said everything we know is one of these two things. Now, a relation of ideas is a certainty, a 100% certainty, which cannot be false, the denial of which entails a contradiction. A relation of ideas, moreover, is not known from experience, and also does not seem to concern the world outside the mind at all. It's a relation of ideas within the mind. Propositions of this kind are discoverable by the mere operation of thought without dependence on what is anywhere existent in the universe. Matters of fact, however, do concern the world outside the mind, Matters of fact, which are the second objects of human reason, are not ascertained in this manner. That is to say, matters of fact are known not by the mere operation of thought alone. Matters of fact are known from experience. No matter of fact is 100% certain, because its denial does not imply a contradiction. To deny the Pythagorean theorem is to produce a mathematical contradiction. To say that 2 plus 2 does not equal 4 is to affirm a contradiction. Matters of fact are not like that. The denial of a matter of fact is something that does not entail a contradiction, and it is always possible that such a thing is true. Matters of fact cannot be proven with 100% certainty, and they are learned from experience alone. But this is the kind of knowledge that concerns the world outside the mind. Now, Hume has divided human knowledge into these two categories, relations of ideas and matters of fact. And in this series, we're going to be exploring what he does following on this distinction in sections 4 and 5 of the Inquiry. Before getting to subsequent videos, subsequent remarks, and a fuller picture of what he does in sections 4 and 5, let's just make a few observations on why this passage is so significant. This is an extremely influential passage. This, this one page of Hume is maybe, maybe one of the very most influential one pages of the history of philosophy ever. There are very few pages in the history of philosophy which by themselves have been uh, comparably important. Now, briefly, I'll see if I can tell you three reasons these, uh, these words are important. First, the distinction between relations of ideas and matters of fact, as Hume has laid it out here, has been philosophically influential, but even more culturally influential, on what we call the fact-value dichotomy, which is to say the theory that no statement of value is ever a statement of fact, that statements of values uh, never overlap. In, um, uh, in technical Venn diagram terminology from the logic class, you shade areas that are empty. So um, you, you, you fill in an area that represents something uh, where nothing exists. So if we had a circle for 
dogs in a circle for cats. Since no cats are dogs, the space in the middle would be shaded in to indicate emptiness. The space for statements of fact and statements of values would then be shaded in in the overlapping region. But um, if that's difficult to follow, forget that and just go with <laughs> Venn diagrams outside of logic class. According to the fact value dichotomy theory, statements of fact and statements of values are circles that never touch. They don't overlap at all. There's no such thing as a statement of both fact and value according to the theory of the fact value dichotomy, which takes a lot of inspiration from Hume. Now, Hume himself and his writings on ethics is, um, well, it's something I don't want to touch in this video. I'm just looking at this particular text, and here I'm, um, I'm commenting on some of its historical significance. In fact, I don't want to say anything else about Hume on the subject. I want to say something about the logical positivists. They followed Hume in his, um, his philosophy of language here, and they also thought, uh, essentially accepting this passage, they also thought that... Every statement which we know, and indeed every statement which is even meaningful, is either a relation of ideas or it is a matter of fact, and a matter of fact is known from experience. And the logical positivists thought that value statements cannot be verified in experience. Accordingly, they are not even meaningful. Logical positivism, as I understand it, and this is no doubt uh, something of an oversimplification, Logical positivism is largely an attempt to take these principles from Hume and apply them very thoroughly, very consistently, and as clearly as possible. And so the idea that no facts are values, uh, no value statements, no value judgments are factual, is um, influenced by this passage in Hume, and that influence runs largely through the tradition of logical positivism and has had enormous cultural influence. That's one reason this passage is important. Another reason this passage is important is it sets the stage for Kant. I'll do this as briefly as I can, but Hume seems to think that all relations of ideas are analytic and a priori, and all matters of fact are synthetic and a posteriori. Now, Quite possibly, you do not know what these terms mean, so let me define them very briefly. An analytic statement is one whose predicate is contained in its subject, which is a fancy way of saying that an analytic statement is one in which the subject of the statement, or rather the idea of the subject of the statement, already includes everything that's in the rest of the sentence. So the statement, all bachelors are unmarried men, is analytic because the concept of unmarried men is already contained in the concept of bachelor. The concept of four is entailed by the concept of two plus two. An analytic statement is like that. The subject, in, the subject of the sentence includes everything else the sentence says about the subject. That's an analytic statement. A synthetic statement is a statement where you might actually add some information. Um, well, in, a, in an analytic concept, in an analytic statement, you might clarify something, but you don't normally understand. Uh, it's not normal to understand analytic statements as adding information. They're just um, spelling out what was already there, what was in the idea of the subject already contained everything else in the sentence. A synthetic statement is a statement that's not like that. It's a statement where you can actually add some new information, where what you say about a thing is not already contained in the very idea of the thing. So um, the cup is in my hand. The idea of the cup does not entail its being in my hand, whereas the idea of unmarried man is already in the idea of a bachelor. So that's the distinction between analytic and synthetic statements. Now we can do the next part more briefly. An a priori statement is one learned independently of experience, and an a posteriori statement is one learned from experience. So Hume here is setting up a perfect correspondence between analytic and a priori statements and between synthetic and a posteriori statements. He thinks all relations of ideas are analytic. The subject contains everything else that's in the sentence. And all matters of fact are synthetic. The subject does not contain everything else in the sentence. And all matters of fact are a posteriori. They can only be learned from experience and all Relations of ideas are a priori, they are learned independently of experience. Now, this may sound like 
thoroughly um, confusing philosophy of language. And um, I don't want to get any further into it in this video. <laughs> Let me just state that the enormously influential and important philosophy of Kant centers on his idea that there is such a thing as a synthetic a priori statement. A statement which we did not learn from experience, but whose subject does not contain everything said about it in the rest of the sentence. This is an extremely important idea in, well, in philosophy of language, but it's also at the heart of Kantian ethics. It's at the heart of everything else in Kant's philosophy. So Hume, here in this passage, has set the stage for Kant to come along and say, no, no, this is not a thorough and correct summary of all human concepts. We do have some ideas which are not known from experience, but are not, as Hume has defined them, relations of ideas. Now, third, and this is what we're going to do, in, uh, what we're going to emphasize in the remaining videos in the series, because this is what Hume emphasizes in sections four and five of the inquiry. This passage is important because it sets us up with a really important and interesting uh, problem in epistemology and in philosophy of science. In order to learn about the world from experience, we need to have in place some method by which we learn about the world from experience. And in particular, uh, let's, let's look at it this way. In order to learn about, say, gravity, you have to make some observations and then draw some conclusions. We can observe that this pen falls towards the center of the earth when it's unobstructed. So does this marker. So does this tape roll. And we can repeat the exercise with more things. This comb does the same thing. And what do we conclude from all this? We conclude that unobstructed objects always fall towards the center of the earth or, or some such formulation. Make it a little more precise according to a better understanding of physics, if you like. Say something about... Um, gravitational pull of the earth or something, but realizing that we're not making this thoroughly precise in terms of physics, you make a generalized statement about all objects which are unobstructed falling towards the center of the earth when you actually haven't observed them all. You're reasoning from a small number of objects you have observed to a conclusion about all the falling objects there are, well, all the unobstructed objects there are and saying they all fall towards the center of the earth when unobstructed. So you're reasoning about what you have not experienced from what you have, and that's what science does. This is what we human beings do when we learn about the world from experience. We learn about parts of it we have not yet experienced from what we have. How can you do that if Hume is correct? If Hume is correct, relations of ideas are not even about the world, and matters of fact can only be learned from experience. But in order to learn from experience, in order to learn about these matters of fact from experience, we must have in place some principle which allows us to make that inference from what we have not experienced to what we ha from what we have experienced to what we have not experienced. And that principle is itself not learned from experience. It's not a relation of ideas. And if it's a matter of fact, well, it's not one learned from experience. So where the heck does it come from? That is the question Hume is going to ask and is going to, uh, well, it inspires his skeptical doubts. And he is going to give his skeptical solution to these doubts in um, section five. So stay tuned, I guess. David Hume's Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. We are reading from... Section 4, which is about skeptical doubts concerning the operations of the understanding. Section 4, Part 1. Hume says, It may therefore be a subject worthy of curiosity to inquire what is the nature of that evidence which assures us of any real existence and matter of fact beyond the present testimony of our senses or the records of our memory. To review what was in the last video, Hume says all our knowledge is either a relation of ideas or a matter of fact. And a relation of ideas concerns our ideas. It concerns how one concept in the mind relates to another concept in the mind. It does not seem to concern the world outside the mind. All knowledge of the world outside the mind is gathered from experience. And so, it may therefore be a subject worthy of curiosity, the fancy language for it might be important and worth looking into, to inquire what is the nature of that evidence which assures us of any matters of fact except, of course, um, the present testimony of our senses or the records of our memory. Well, maybe you can take those. But how do we know anything else beyond um, 
my my immediate perception of something blue here, and maybe some memories about um, what I've experienced in the past. How do we learn anything about the facts of the world? How do we know what is the effect of me drinking this tea? How do we know what is the effect of anything? How do we know um, how gravity works? How do we know um, what will happen if I drop this this tape roll? How do we know what's going to happen? We thought we did know. We knew it was going to fall, didn't we? Well, how did we know that it was going to fall? Did we actually know it, says Hume? And in fact, we did not. And let's see why. The thing about matters of fact is most of what we learn about them depends on causality, which is to say the principle that there is such a thing as cause and effect in the world. Cause and effect happens. He says, all reasonings concerning matter of fact seem to be founded on the relation of cause and effect. It's by assuming that causality works, that cause and effect happens in the world, that we learn most of what we know about the world. This is how we are able to conclude from having observed that when I dropped this thing, it fell, this tape roll, and when I dropped this pen, it also fell, when I dropped this Nietzsche book, it also fell. From observing this, we conclude that all unobstructed objects fall towards the center of the Earth, maybe refining the statement a bit for uh, proper knowledge of um, astronomy and physics, but the general idea doesn't depend on phrasing it perfectly. The point is, we learn from experience by reasoning to some general conclusion about how the world works from our observations of how it has worked in our very limited experience. And this reasoning works only if we assume that cause and effect works. We assume there's something, we call it gravity, that is pulling this tape roll down. We assume there's something called gravity pulling the pen, the Nietzsche book, down. We assume this. That's how we get to our conclusions about gravity, and that's the sort of reasoning we follow with pretty much everything other than, well, the present testimony of our senses or records of our memory, besides what we're consciously aware of having um, experienced in the past or currently experiencing, I see the blue in front of me and so on. Besides all that, everything we know about the world seems to depend on the assumption that cause and effect is in place. Here it is constantly supposed that there is a connection between the present fact and that which is inferred from it. Were there nothing to bind them together, the inference would be entirely precarious. You think that when I let go of this Nietzsche book, it's going to fall towards the center of the earth. Why do you think that? You assume there's a connection between this event and the next event. How do you know that that connection is there? Because you're assuming that there's such a thing as cause and effect. The pull of gravity is going to cause the Nietzsche book to fall. Well, it worked again, didn't it? But how did you know? You knew by assuming that something had caused it to fall the first time, and the second time, and the third time, and now the fourth or fifth time. I've lost count. The assumption of cause and effect is what allows you to draw these inferences. However, we must venture to inquire how we arrive at the knowledge of cause and effect. I shall venture to affirm, says Hume, as a general proposition which admits of no exception, that the knowledge of this relation is not in any instance attained by reasonings a priori, but arises entirely from experience. And we find that any particular objects are constantly conjoined with each other, or any particular event. The event of me dropping the book and the event of the book falling towards the center of the earth, well, they always seem to be connected. So, well, they always seem to be conjoined. One always follows after the other, and so we assume that they are connected. Me dropping the book caused it to fall, or, well, if you want to get a little more precise, me dropping the book removed the obstructions so that gravity caused it to fall. We assume that there's a cause and effect relationship connecting one event to the other. And that that's why it's always happened in the past and also why it's going to keep happening in the future. You think it's about to happen again, don't you? Well, how do you know that? Well, it's not by a priori reasoning, which is to say reasoning independently of experience. It's by reasoning from experience. Knowledge of cause and effect depends entirely on experience. And so we're going to have to figure out how we got that knowledge from experience. That's the point of Hume's analysis here in section four. Knowledge of causality depends on experience, and it's crucial to note that one event does not include 
the next event. The idea of one event does not include the idea of the next event. Then we would be reasoning a priori. We would be reasoning independently of experience. But all we know about cause and effect depends on experience. The first time a baby sees a person let go of a book, the baby doesn't know that it's about to fall. That knowledge is picked up from experience. And how do we get it from experience? Well, we've observed that our knowledge of the world outside the mind depends largely on understanding that cause and effect is in place. So now we have to figure out where do we get that knowledge? We're, we're looking at the foundations of knowledge. What Hume is doing is raising skeptical doubts concerning the operations of the understanding. He's trying to study the foundations of knowledge and um, perhaps a better phrasing would be critique the foundations of knowledge. Knowledge of the world outside the mind depends on causality and now he wants to know where do we get that knowledge from? Knowledge of causality, well, we get it from experience. But how do we get it from experience? That's the next question. From David Hume's Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, Section 4, Skeptical Doubts Concerning the Operations of the Understanding, Part 2. Hume says, When it is asked, what is the nature of all our reasonings concerning matter of fact? The proper answer seems to be, that they are founded on the relation of cause and effect. When again it is asked, what is the foundation of all our reasonings and conclusions concerning that relation? It may be replied in one word, experience. But if we still carry on our sifting humor and ask, what is the foundation of all conclusions from experience? This implies a new question, which may be of a more difficult solution and explication. So, what he said so far is that human knowledge concerns either relations of ideas or matters of fact. Relations of ideas are great. That's where we get math and geometry from. That's where we get the Pythagorean theorem. And it's 100% certain, and it's independent of experience, but also, unfortunately, it doesn't concern the facts in the world. It's about our ideas. Relations of ideas are not about the world outside the mind. Matters of fact are. Human knowledge, if it's not a relation of ideas, a matter of fact. Well, how do we get knowledge of the facts in the world. How do we know how the world works? How do we know what happens in the world and how it works? How do we do science? How do we learn about the world? Hume says our knowledge about the world depends, well, largely on, other than um, our knowledge of um, our present experiences and memories, our knowledge of the world depends on causality, depends on the assumption that cause and effect happen. I dropped the Nietzsche book once, I drop it again, I drop it a third time, I drop it a fourth time, and every time it falls towards the center of the Earth. And so I conclude that there is something, and I call it gravity, that is causing it to fall when unobstructed. And this is how we reason about the world from experience by relying on the principle of cause and effect. But Hume is studying the foundations of human knowledge of the world. And the, uh, if you had to state in one sentence the great insight of uh, the inquiry concerning human understanding, or at least of sections four and five, I, I would say of the entire book, the great insight is knowledge of the world outside the mind has a foundation. Hume is studying the foundation. And he's gotten so far in this passage we're looking at here, he's gotten so far as to say the foundation of knowledge of the world outside the mind is causality. But causality itself is not one of those relations of ideas. Knowledge of causality comes from experience because, again, we observe that something happens, one event follows the next event, something happens and then something else happens, and the, the second event, the book falling, always follows the first event, me letting go of the book, and so we assume that there's something, and we call it gravity, that is causing the second event to follow after the first event. How do we get that assumption? Well, how do we get that conclusion? By reasoning from experience, because causality is a great explanation for why these things keep happening, for why the second event always follows on the first event. Causality, cause and effect, which gives us the principle that gravity is pulling things towards the center of the earth, blah, blah, blah. This is a great explanation of our experiences, but how do we derive it from experience? If we carry on our sifting humor and ask, what is the foundation of all conclusions from experience? How do we learn anything from experience? This implies a new question, which may be more difficult. And Hume continues, I say then that even after we have experience of the operations of cause and effect, our conclusions from that experience are not founded on any reasoning or on any process of the understanding. How do we get from 
the premise that uh, this book falls in our experience every time I let go of it. How do we get from the premise that it's fallen, I don't know, ten times when I've let go of it, to the conclusion that something called gravity is causing it to fall? And in fact, Hume says that conclusion is not a product of reason. It's not founded on reason or any process of the understanding. On what then is it founded? There is, a, there is here a consequence drawn by the mind. There is a certain step taken, he says, a process of thought and an inference which wants to be explained or which needs to be explained. These two propositions are far from the same. I have found that such an object has always been attended with such an effect, and I foresee that other objects, which are in appearance similar, will be attended with similar effects. I observe that one event, uh, if the event is clearer, you can do, do with objects, but I would need a different illustration, like um, billiard balls or something, but I'm going to stick with the ex illustration I've been using. One event, I find, is always attended by another event. I let go of the book, and it falls. Well, I conclude that other objects which are similar will be attended with similar effects. Other events which are similar will have similar effects. If I take one of these books, uh, one of these Augustine books off the shelf behind me and let go of it, it too will fall. I conclude that. How do I get that conclusion? I shall allow, if you please, says Hugh, that the one proposition may be justly inferred from the other. I know, in fact, that it always is inferred. We do always conclude that things will happen in the future as they have in the past, that next time I drop the book, it's going to fall again. You believe that that will happen. But why is what Hume wants to know. He says you do make the inference. It's an appropriate inference. It's a just inference. But if you insist that the inference is made by a chain of reasoning, I desire you to produce that reasoning. What is the reasoning that allows you to conclude one premise, uh, to conclude that conclusion from those premises? What is the connection between these propositions? Hume says it passes my comprehension to know what that connection is is. So, what's the connection? He also says this, whatever is intelligible and can be distinctly conceived implies no contradiction and can never be proved false by any demonstrative argument or abstract reasoning a priori. In other words, without having experienced the next time I drop this book to see whether it falls, we cannot prove that it's going to fall, except by assuming that cause and effect is in place, and that thing we call gravity is going to draw them towards the center of the Earth. But that's the conclusion we're talking about, how we get from the premise that it's happened low these many times to the conclusion that it always happens, that the book falls towards the center of the Earth when unobstructed. What is the nature of that reasoning? Hume doesn't have a problem with the reasoning. and the principle that cause and effect is in place is how we get knowledge of everything else. That's great. He has no problem with that, but he wants to know how we get to that conclusion that there was a cause for it happening the way it did every time in the past. And since he has stated way back at the beginning of section four, when he, since he stated that human knowledge is either a relation of ideas or a matter of fact, he's exclude any possibility of reasoning independently of experience getting us to this conclusion. The inference can only be made from experience, but this itself is how we get knowledge from experience. So how does it itself come about from experience? There seems to be no available answer. From David Hume's Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, Section 4, Part 2. We have said that all our arguments concerning existence are founded on the relation of cause and effect that our knowledge of that relation is derived entirely from experience, and that all our experimental conclusions proceed upon the supposition that the future will be conformable to the past. To endeavor, to endeavor, therefore, the proof of this last supposition by probable arguments, or arguments regarding existence, must be evidently going in a circle, and taking that for granted, which is the very point in question. Hume is trying to figure out how we get knowledge about the world from experience, and he says all our knowledge about the world seems to depend on cause and effect on understanding that causality is real, that cause and effect happens. Things happen causing other things to happen. How do we know, though, that cause and effect happens? Well, that also we learn from experience. 
by means of the principle of induction. The principle of induction is the principle that we can draw conclusions about what we have not experienced from what we have experienced. Closely related to this principle is the principle of the uniformity of nature. Here Hume refers to that as the supposition that the future will be conformable to the past. Uh, elsewhere, the supposition that the future will resemble the past, that similar powers will be conjoined with similar sensible qualities, or um, uh, that the course of nature uh, is going to be the same. The principle of the uniformity of nature is the principle that things happen the same way. Things in the future will happen the same way they did in the past. The same fundamental uh, principles that explain reality are always in place. Whatever laws of physics were governing things that happened in the past will still be in place in the future, and thus we can make predictions about the future. And we can uh, posit general rules, uh, general laws, general descriptions about how the world works. Well, this will justify cause and effect. This will justify science. This will justify our learning about the world from experience. This is the foundation of empirical knowledge. But what is the foundation of the foundation? You can justify cause and effect by induction. You can justify induction by the uniformity of nature. But how do you prove the uniformity of nature? The principle of induction and the principle of the uniformity of nature are not, as Hume uh, uses the terminology, relations of ideas. The, uh, these are not statements whose uh, subject contains their predicate. They're not analytic statements. Go back and find earlier videos on the subject if, um, uh, if this terminology is not familiar to you. These are not a priori certainties. They are not things that we know independently of experience, um, simply in terms of the necessity of the sentences themselves. These are statements about the world. These are factual statements about how the world works. And so how do we know them except from experience? But these are the things by which we learn about the world from experience. So, what on earth can possibly be their justification? There's nothing contradictory about the denial of the principle of induction or the principle of the uniformity of nature. So, uh, they're not, again, uh, relations of ideas. Um, the contrary of them is still possible. Um, all of this is uh, drawing, of course, from what has preceded, in particular from the beginning of section 4, part 1, where he describes relations of ideas and matters of fact. And um, if the principle of induction and the principle of the uniformity of nature and cause and effect are not relations of ideas, and they're not, since they're not, rather, they must be matters of fact, but they are how we know matters of fact. So how then can we know them? That is the problem. Now, we cannot prove the principle of induction, but we seem pretty happy to live by it. Now, Hume here makes an important point. You might argue for these principles. You might argue that the uniformity of nature is in place based on, well, how consistent nature has worked in the past, and therefore it's probably going to keep doing that in the future. But that argument assumes what it's trying to prove. It's arguing in a circle. You might say that this principle has often led us to truth in the past, and so it's likely to lead us to truth in the future. But again, this is an argument using induction. This is an argument presuming, in fact, the uniformity of nature. It's drawing a conclusion about what we have not experienced from something that we have experienced. Maybe that's worked in the past, but that's not a good argument that it's going to work in the future, because the supposition that it um, that you can reason about the future from the past is the very point in question. You can't argue that you can draw conclusions about what you have not experienced from what you have experienced on the grounds that we've done it in the past and therefore we can keep doing it in the future because you're using the same reasoning that you're trying to justify. It's arguing in a circle. That approach, Hume says, will not work. This will be a short video on what Hume is not doing in the inquiry concerning human understanding. Part 4. Here in section 2 of part 4 he says, And though none but a fool or madman will ever pretend to dispute the authority of experience or to reject that great guide of human life, it may surely be allowed a philosopher to have so much curiosity at least as to examine the principle of human nature which gives this mighty authority to experience and makes us draw advantage from the similarity which nature has placed among different objects. Hume is not advising us to disbelieve in causality, induction, or the uniformity of nature. Hume 
is studying the foundations of knowledge about the world, the foundations of knowledge from experience, the foundations of empirical knowledge. He is saying that there is such a thing as the foundations of empirical knowledge. And those foundations are the principle of cause and effect, the principle that causality is real, that some things cause other things, and the principle of induction, that we can reason about what we have not experienced from what we have, and the principle of the uniformity of nature, that the same fundamental principles that govern reality are always in place. These are the foundations of empirical knowledge, and he's trying to figure out how we know them. And he's doubting whether we have any good reason to believe them, but he's not telling us not to believe them. He says, only a fool or a madman would doubt them, though none but a fool or madman will ever pretend to dispute the authority of experience. A philosopher still has the business of asking, how do we know these principles? You should continue to believe that we can learn about the world from experience by relying on induction, causality, and uniformity of nature. Only a fool or a madman would say otherwise, say Hume. But a philosopher has the business of asking, how do we know what we think we know about the world? If we know it by assuming these things, how do we know these things? That is his question. From David Hume's Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, we are looking now at section 5, the skeptical solution of the skeptical doubts Hume has raised in section 4. Now, to review those skeptical doubts, Hume has said that our knowledge of the world outside the mind, beyond knowledge of our immediate perceptions and our memories of what we've experienced in the past, all our knowledge of anything else, particularly our knowledge of general principles, depends on cause and effect. It depends on understanding that there are causes and effects in the world, that causality happens. So, I perceive right now that these pens and pencils, uh, pens, pencil, and highlighter are falling towards the center of the earth. And now that fact that that happened is stored in my memory. But how do I know that it's going to happen again? How do I know that there's such a thing as gravity? How do I know that next time I drop these writing utensils, they will fall towards the center of the earth? Hume thinks they will. Hume thinks you should continue to think that they will. But he wants to know, how do you know that they will? And he says, our knowledge of such general principles, like unobstructed objects fall towards the center of the earth, our knowledge of such principles depends on cause and effect. And there's no knowledge of the world which depends on the principle that cause and effect happen, unless we also know cause and effect. There's no knowledge that depends on a certain principle unless we also know that principle. This knowledge is derived from the principle that cause and effect happen, so we have to know that principle as well in order to know anything that's derived from it. Well, how do we know cause and effect happens? Not by any reasoning independently of experience, but we learn about cause and effect from experience. And how do we learn about cause and effect from experience? Taking it deeper, Hume has said, we're still reviewing part four here, section four, Hume has said that knowledge of cause and effect depends on induction and the uniformity of nature. Now let's state those principles. The principle of induction is the principle that we can reason about what we have not experienced from what we have. The principle of the uniformity of nature is the principle that, loosely speaking, things always happen the same way. Or, a little more precisely, the same fundamental principles that govern the world are always in place. Or, the same laws of physics, the same foundational laws of physics are always in place. Things will continue to happen in the future the way they have in the past. And if uh, writing utensils, when unobstructed, have fallen towards the center of the earth in the past, next time I drop them, they will do the same. The uniformity of nature and induction, or the principles of the uniformity of nature and induction, are how we know cause and effect. But how do we know them is now the question Hume brings us to. And it turns out we don't know them by reasoning either, and we don't actually know them from experience, because they are how we learn from experience. They are the principles by which we learn about the world from experience, so you can't learn about them from experience. So, how do we know them? Now, in part one of section five, Hume's going to start to give his answer. And he says, there is some other principle which determines him to form such a conclusion, to form the conclusion that causality works because of the principle of induction and the principle of 
the uniformity of nature. There is some other principle which determines a person to form such a conclusion. This principle is custom or habit. This principle is a custom or habit. That is why we believe in induction or the uniformity of nature. Not as the product of reasoning about the world from experience, because this is how we reason about the world from experience. It's not the product of reason about the world from experience. It is the source of reason about the world from experience. So what's the source of that source? Custom or habit. The ultimate principle which we can assign of all our conclusions from experience, the ultimate principle is this principle of custom or habit. We have a custom, we have a habit of believing that induction works and acting accordingly, of believing that there is a uniformity to nature and uh, reasoning accordingly. All inferences from experience, therefore, are effects of custom, not of reasoning saith David Hume. We'll see more in the next video. From David Hume's Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, still in Section 5, The Skeptical Solution to the Doubts Raised in Section 4. Hume has said that our knowledge about the world outside the mind comes from the principle that cause and effect exist, the principle of causality. And our knowledge of causality comes from the principle of induction and the principle of the uniformity of nature, the principle that we can reason about what we have not yet experienced from what we have, and the principle that the same fundamental laws of physics are always in place. Things happen the same ways at one time as they do at another time, and in one place as they do in another place, such that we can conclude about what we have uh, we can draw conclusions about what we have not experienced from what we have. This is uh, these are the principles that allow us to conclude that cause and effect exist, and that is the foundation of our knowledge about the world outside the mind. But what is the foundation of the foundation? He has said it is custom or habit. We don't actually have any reasoning that promotes the principle of induction and the principle of the uniformity of nature. These are the principles by which we reason about the world from experience, and they do not themselves come from any reasoning independently of experience, and they can't come from experience because they are how we reason from experience. So they're not reasoned, they're not the products of reasoning from experience. They are the source of reasoning from experience, and they don't come from reason independently of experience. So where do they come from? They come from habit or custom. It is a human custom to believe in induction. It is a human custom to believe in the uniformity of nature. Custom, then, is the great guide of human life it is that principle alone which renders our experience useful to us and makes us expect for the future a similar train of events with those which have appeared in the past. Without the influence of custom, we should be entirely ignorant of every matter of fact beyond what is immediately present to the memory and senses. We should never know how to adjust means to ends or to employ our natural powers in the production of any effect. There would be an end at once of all action as well as of the chief part of speculation. There would be an end at once of all action and of most speculation if we did not have the custom to believe in the uniformity of nature and believe that induction works. What then is the conclusion of the whole matter? Skipping one paragraph. What is the conclusion? He's perhaps having in mind the biblical language at the end of uh, Ecclesiastes. What now? Here now the conclusion of the matter, but uh, never mind that. That's aside. What then is the conclusion of the whole matter? A simple one, though it must be confessed pretty remote from the common theories of philosophy. All belief of matter of fact or real existence is derived merely from some object present to the memory or senses and a customary conjunction between that and some other objects. Or in other words, having found in many instances that two kinds of objects have always been conjoined together, the mind is carried by custom to expect that the same shall happen in the future. I'm, uh, I've begun to paraphrase rather than read. Let's, um, let me give you his actual words. Having found in many instances that any two kinds of objects, flame and heat, snow and cold, have always been conjoined together, if flame or snow be presented anew to the senses, the mind is carried by custom to expect heat or cold and to believe that such a quality does exist and will discover itself upon a nearer approach. This belief is the necessary result of placing the mind in such circumstances. When 
we observe that in our past experience, fire is associated with heat or cold is associated with snow. We conclude that it will be that way in the future. Why? Because we believe in cause and effect. Why? Because we believe in the uniformity of nature and we believe that induction works, that we can reason about what we have not yet experienced from what we have. This custom of believing this way is the great guide of human life. And only a fool or a madman, he has said, would not follow this custom. But it's just a custom. It's not the product of reason. David Hume's inquiry concerning human understanding from section 5, a skeptical solution to the doubts that Hume had raised in section 4. Now Hume has said that our knowledge of the world outside the mind depends on the principle of causality, or at least our knowledge about the world beyond our immediate perceptions and our memories of what we've experienced in the past. Knowledge beyond that depends on cause and effect. And knowledge of cause and effect depends on the principle of induction and the principle of the uniformity of nature, the principle that we can reason about the world where we have not experienced it from that which we have experienced. We can reason about what we have not experienced from what we have experienced. And the principle that the world always works the same way. At least the fundamental principles that govern the world are always in place. The same rules of physics the same fundamental laws of physics are always governing the world. So things happening in the world where we have not experienced them will be pretty much the same as things happening in the world where we have experienced them. This is how we know about cause and effect, which is how we know everything else we know about the world beyond our own immediate perceptions and memories, except we don't actually know any of this stuff. Now understand that the word skeptic can have more than one meaning. Anyone who says Hume is a skeptic about causality is misunderstanding Hume rather badly if by skeptic that person means someone who disbelieves. Hume is not disbelieving in causality. What Hume is doing is saying we do not have this knowledge. As it turns out, the skeptical doubts are doubts about the foundations of knowledge about the world outside the mind, and the skeptical solution is skeptical only in a weak sense of the term. It's not the strong sense of skepticism where you might say, well, we should not believe in causality, there's no such thing. It's skepticism in a weak sense of the term. We do not know, but we must believe. Hume is a skeptic about knowledge, not about fact, if you want to put it that way. Hume is not ceasing to believe in cause and effect, but he is telling us the foundations of our knowledge about the world outside the mind are not themselves knowledge. The foundation of all our knowledge of these things is uniformity of nature and induction, or the principles of the uniformity of nature and of induction, and these principles we believe by custom or habit, which is not a case of knowledge. So. He's a skeptic about knowledge. He says, we don't actually know any of these things. But he's not saying you should not believe it. He's saying you should believe it. But you should understand that there is a foundation to your beliefs, and that foundation is the human custom or the human habit of believing these things, not knowledge of these things, uh, of induction and uniformity of nature. He's a skeptic in a weak sense of the term. He does not cease to believe. He's quite clear that only a fool or a madman would cease to believe in cause and effect, and so on. But we should recognize that our knowledge does not have knowledge at its foundation. There is a foundation for what we call knowledge, and if you want to get technical, we don't know anything about the world outside the mind. We should believe, but we do not know. Thus says Hume. Now, we've so far used the term custom and the term habit, a term that I think is somewhat more useful in helping us understand what Hume is talking about here is the term instinct. Now, let's finally get back to the text. We are in part two of the uh, skeptical solution of these doubts. That's to say, part two of section five. Hume says, all these operations, that is to say, these operations of the mind, all these operations are a species of natural instincts which no reasoning or process of the thought and understanding is able either to produce or to prevent. This 
custom or habit by which we believe in the uniformity of nature and believe that we can reason about the world from what we have experienced to what we have not experienced, reason about what we have not experienced from what we have. These beliefs are a human custom and a human habit and a human instinct thus to believe. Skipping now towards uh, part two, towards the end, in fact, of section five, Hume says, When I throw a piece of dry wood into a fire, my mind is immediately carried to conceive that it augments, not extinguishes the flame. This transition of thought from the cause to the effect proceeds not from reason. It derives its origin altogether from custom and experience. Here are these words again. Experience is the source of knowledge, not reasoning prior to experience. But we get this knowledge from experience ultimately by custom or habit. Let's go to the last paragraph. It is more conformable to the ordinary wisdom of nature to secure so necessary an act of the mind by some instinct or mechanical tendency, which may be infallible in its operations, etc., etc. As nature has taught us the use of our limbs, etc., etc., so she has implanted in us an instinct, which carries forward the thought in a corresponding course to that which she has established among external objects. In other words, Hume thinks we really ought to believe in cause and effect. And he thinks that cause and effect really do work in the world outside the mind. Nature has them there. The world, the laws of physics, involve cause and effect. And that's just the truth. But we can't know that for sure. We believe it by means of an instinct. And this human custom to believe, or this human habit of thus believing, is in fact fundamentally an instinct uh, implanted in us by nature. The source of human knowledge of the world outside the mind is merely the instinct to believe in the legitimacy of inductive reasoning and in the uniformity of nature. Now this will be a final video in this series on the inquiry concerning human understanding by David Hume, sections four and five. I hope to compile these into a video for the great text playlist, but originally these are shorter videos for the, the philosophers in their own words playlist. In this particular video, um, I may not actually um, appeal directly to his own words, except occasionally calling forth a phrase for memory, but we need this video in order to make sense of everything else. Uh, probably. Probably you need this video. Um, and if not you, someone else watching this needs this to make some sense of Hume. We need to summarize and clarify a few things. So section four is about skeptical doubts concerning the operations of human understanding. Section five contains a skeptical solution to these doubts. So we want to overview what are the doubts and what is the solution. We need to clarify what skepticism means here. We need to clarify some of the available logic and we need to point towards alternatives. All right, so these skeptical doubts go basically like this, summarizing a lot of text very briefly. Section four of the inquiry concerning human understanding by David Hume, skeptical doubts Knowledge of the world outside the mind depends on cause and effect. We may know some things about um, the world from our own perceptions, or at least we know that we have these perceptions, and we may know a few pointers from memory of what we've experienced in the past, but all our other knowledge about the world outside the mind seems to depend on causality. It depends on knowing that cause and effect happen. Causality exists, cause and effect exist, one thing causes another thing. But our Understanding of the fact that one thing causes another thing is not a priori, that is to say, it's not a product of pure reason independently of experience, it's a conclusion from experience. Now, where do we get that conclusion? How do we get that conclusion from experience? By means of the principle of induction and the principle of the uniformity of nature. The principle of induction is the principle that we can reason about what we have not experienced from what we have. And the principle of the uniformity of nature is the principle that the same laws of physics are always in place, or the, the world will always continue to operate in the same way as it always has, and things will happen the same way at one time and at one place as they did at another time or another place. So 
the principle of induction and the principle of the uniformity of nature are how we get our knowledge of cause and effect, which is how we get all our other knowledge of the world outside the mind beyond knowledge of what we currently perceive or currently remember. But our knowledge of induction or uniformity of the nature or the uniformity of nature is, in fact, nothing of the sort. There is no knowledge of it. We believe in it by a human custom or a human habit or a human instinct to believe that this works, that we can reason about what we have not experienced from what we have. That's how we know about causality, but we don't know that. We only <laughs> believe it by a human custom or a human habit or a human instinct. That is the skeptical solution to these doubts. Now let's clarify the term skepticism and then try to clarify the word knowledge uh, and make sure there's no confusion there or as little as possible anyway. And then um, do whatever else we need to do. Clarify the logic, I think, and um, look at what are some of the alternatives. So the word skepticism here is skepticism in a weak sense of the term. Hume is not the kind of skeptic who says, I don't believe that cause and effect are real. There may still be some people saying that that's what Hume teaches, that Hume is a skeptic who denies the reality of cause and effect, who denies that cause and effect actually happen in the world. No! Hume does not deny that cause and effect are real things. He does not deny that one thing causes another thing. Hume thinks this is true. This is a mind-independent fact about the world that cause and effect are real. But he does deny that we know it. And now, let's clarify the word knowledge. Hume is not the skeptic who says we do not, uh, we should not believe that cause and effect exists, or we should not believe anything about the world. Hume is the kind of skeptic who says we don't actually know anything. So I have sometimes spoken loosely using the word knowledge. And um, I'll call that the limitations of uh, my own mind. It's difficult to speak precisely about these matters all the time. To be fair, Hume isn't always that precise himself. Hume says all knowledge, if we have it, of the world outside the mind would depend on causality. And all of that knowledge of causality would depend on uniformity of nature and induction, which we believe not by knowledge but by mere instinct or habit or custom. And this instinct is not a form of knowledge. Well, how then uh, do we have any knowledge? We don't. Hume is not the skeptic who denies fact. He's the skeptic who believes the fact and says, you must believe the fact. Only a fool or a madman would do otherwise. But understand that what you believe, you do not know. We don't have this knowledge of the world outside the mind. In fact, we don't have any knowledge of the world outside the mind. No knowledge at all of the world outside the mind. We have rational belief which is the product of a very useful instinct implanted in the human being by nature. But we do not have knowledge. So those are the skeptical doubts. That's the skeptical solution, but it's a weak sense of the term skepticism. And Hume is not saying that we should not believe these things. He's saying we do not, in fact, know them. And if I ever used the word knowledge incorrectly, I was speaking hypothetically and, uh, well, imprecisely, but uh, I can justify that some, to some extent by saying I was speaking Hypothetically, any knowledge of the world outside the mind, if there is any, must depend on causality. Knowledge of causality must depend on uniformity of nature but uh, and induction. But if we get a little deeper, we find you don't know those things at all. So knowledge, if it depends on a particular principle, must depend on us knowing that particular principle. There's no knowledge that comes from the principle of induction, unless we also know the principle of induction, so we don't actually have knowledge. Now let's let's look at the logic here. I believe Hume is thinking something like this about the derivation of cause and effect from induction and uniformity of nature. Because we believe in induction, we assume that like events always follow like events. And since we thus believe that it always happens, we assume that there's a sufficient cause for its happening. So the, the big problem in Hume's epistemology here that he's uh, investigating and giving a skeptical solution for, skepticism in the weak sense of the term, the big problem is it seems that knowledge about the world that comes from experience can only happen if we rely on some principle which is not learned from experience. Knowledge about the world that comes from experience cannot come from experience alone because it has to come by some principle 
that we did not learn from experience. But that principle is not cause and effect. It might look like it at first, but carrying on our sifting humor, as Hume puts it, we find that cause and effect is believed on the basis of induction or uniformity of nature. So at the beginning, Hume has said, uh, in the passage where he gives us our skeptical doubts concerning the operations of the understanding, section 4, at the beginning of section 4, he said, all knowledge of the world outside the mind must come from experience alone, which is precisely why he ends in his skeptical doubts about knowledge, saying we don't actually have any knowledge about the world outside the mind, because knowledge about the world, if it must come from experience alone, and if it also depends on some principle which we do not learn from experience, it doesn't exist. There is no knowledge. If knowledge must, if knowledge about the world outside the mind must depend on some principle by which we get knowledge from experience, and if all knowledge about the world to the mind must come from experience alone, then it must come in part from that principle, which is how we get knowledge from experience, so it's not itself gotten from experience, so there's no knowledge. But that principle is not the principle of causality. It's the principle of induction or the uniformity of nature. Now, as I, as I struggle to get through the text, I can't find Hume being 100% clear here. In my thinking through the logic, I can tell you this, that Hume is not so clear on. Hume, I think, is um, merging the principle of induction and merging the principle of the uniformity of nature, which is fine. He's doing what we call um, phenomenology, actually. Uh, phenomenology, the, the study of human thought as it appears to us, or the study of human perceptions uh, as they happen. Um, very, very roughly defined. It's not just something you find in continental philosophers like Descartes or Edmund Husserl. I think Hume is doing phenomenology here. And if, in fact, in human consciousness, the principle of induction and the principle of the uniformity of nature are merged, fine. He's studying the operations of the human mind, but we can, as he would say, carry on our sifting humor, and we can sift through these principles and look at the principle of induction and the principle of uniformity of nature and do some very brief logic and come to some conclusions, the logic would look like this. We've already reviewed how you can get causality from induction and uniformity of nature, or at least what my working understanding of Hume's thought is like on the subject. So you can actually get the principle of induction from the uniformity of nature or vice versa, but not both, which is the problem. So how do you get induction from uniformity of nature? Well, that's pretty simple. If things always work according to the same fundamental laws of physics, all you need to do is something like this. Observe that these writing utensils fall towards the center of the earth when they are unobstructed and allowed to. And since the same laws of physics are always in place, we assume some law of physics made this happen, and the same law of physics will make it happen again. And if I do it a third time, the same thing will happen. Since the last two times it happened, it happened in accordance with the same laws of physics that will be in place next time I drop these, next time they'll do the same thing they did last time. So in this way, I can reason about what I have not experienced from what I have experienced. Now, that's how you get induction from uniformity of nature. Now try it the other way around. If you believe that we can reason about what we have not experienced from what we have, then you can reason that, well, these... Writing utensils always fall towards the center of the earth when we allow them to, in our experience. And while I've not yet experienced the next time I give them the chance to fall towards the center of the earth, since I can reason about what I have not experienced from what I have experienced, I conclude they'll do the same thing next time. And if they're going to do the same darn thing next time, probably it's because... Things always happen the same way. The same laws of physics that were in place last time are going to be in place next time. That's how you get to the uniformity of nature from induction. Now, again, as I read through Hume's parts four and five here of this book, I don't find him making a clear distinction between these principles, which is probably fine. He's doing some clever work in philosophy. It's not been done a whole lot before Hume anyway. So... Um, it's okay. Or he's doing phenomenology, and again, it's okay. The human mind thinks in terms of the uniformity of nature and reasons inductively about what we have not experienced from what we have without pausing to make a distinction between these principles. 
So what Hume is doing is okay, but you can make a distinction between these principles. And what you learn is knowledge about the world from experience that depends on certain principles, or a certain principle, at least one, which is not learned from experience. And if you move towards the foundation of knowledge, you get to cause and effect. And you find you can get that from experience by depending on induction and uniformity of nature. Carry on your sifting humor, go one step deeper. How do you get knowledge of causality from experience? Well, you get it from induction and uniformity of nature. Hume seems to take these as coming together in the human consciousness. The human mind doesn't pause to make a distinction between these things. That's fine. But if you want to, you can. You can give an argument for induction from the uniformity of nature and go one step deeper. Or you can give an argument for the uniformity of nature from the principle of induction and go one step deeper. But you still have one of these two principles. So one of these principles, cause, um, not causality, but uniformity of nature or induction, one of them can be defended on the basis of the other and causality defended on that basis. But one of them must be left undefended. And so if you presume that all knowledge about the world from experience must come from experience alone, and if there is some principle by which we get knowledge from experience, that principle cannot be known. That is the problem that Hume raises. And he's, he's a genius for figuring this out and articulating it. He's not the first person to investigate these matters. And honestly, I haven't studied Al-Ghazali properly, so I could just give you a few pointers here. Al-Ghazali talks about cause and effect, and it's a different, different theory from Hume, um, a more theological theory. Al-Ghazali, the uh, medieval Islamic philosopher, also points out that uh, knowledge of causality uh, is not contained in your perception of the event. So um, uh, you don't actually see the force of gravity pulling these writing utensils towards the center of the earth. Or... Um, uh, if you swing a cricket bat or a baseball bat and hit a ball, you don't actually perceive the motion of the bat that strikes the ball and the motion of the ball as... Uh, you don't actually see the connection between one event and another. You, you see one event and you see the other, but you don't see the connection between them. You don't actually see the transference of kinetic energy. Al-Ghazali uh, studied this as well and uh, came up with a very different and more theological theory to, to investigate uh, what we do with these doubts about causality. Hume's approach is different. Hume says we get cause knowledge of causality, well, belief in causality, from the very proper and necessary instinct to believe in induction or uniformity of nature. But what Hume did is highly original and very important. If you presume that knowledge about the world must come from experience, and experience alone, then... As Hume discovered, this is the genius of Humean epistemology, you cannot have any actual knowledge. So, that's what Hume accomplishes here, and they call this the problem of induction, and I disagree with that terminology, because the problem of induction is very easy to solve. All you need to do is posit the uniformity of nature, and then you have the problem of the uniformity of nature instead. And again, you can solve that by appealing to induction, and then you're back to having a problem of induction. So again, I don't like calling it the problem of induction. People often do. I think that's not the right terminology. It's the problem of a belief which is necessary for learning about the world from experience, which is not itself derived from experience. And that belief doesn't have to be induction. It could be the uniformity of, the na of nature. But it's one of the two. And that is the problem Hume gives us. What do we do with this problem? Hume's solution is... Believe it, because it's a necessary and useful human instinct given us by nature. It's the great guide of human life. It's not knowledge, but believe it anyway. There are alternatives. I like to call this the, uh, the problem of ex-beliefs, and that's frankly because I don't have a better name for it. And I don't like the name problem of induction, because the problem of the uniformity of nature can easily replace the problem of induction. So problem of ex-beliefs is more inclusive. I define an ex-belief as a belief which is necessary for learning about the world from experience, which is not itself derived from experience. Hume shows us causality gets us close to the foundation, uniformity of nature and induction, working together in the human mind work, and then you have both of those as the uh, foundational belief, the ex-belief that's necessary to learn about the world from experience which it's not itself derived from experience. And doing a little bit of logic and being a little less phenomenological, I say, 
Well, you can take one or the other, but you've got to take one. You're, so you're left with one belief. I prefer to use the term X belief until I have a better idea, but I object to the use of the term problem of induction to describe this problem because problem of induction can be solved with the problem of the uniformity of nature. So Hume uncovers this problem, this problem that knowledge about the world from experience, if we're going to have any at all, must have a foundation. So that foundation is not itself a product of pure reason and is not itself derived from experience because it's how we get knowledge from experience. Now, what are the alternatives? Hume says, believe it, just realize we don't know anything about the world outside the mind. I want to just briefly mention there are alternative theories in epistemology. One very prominent one is Kant. And Kant says these fundamental beliefs by which we reason about the world from experience are a priori, which is to say we get them independently of experience, and that's okay. They are synthetic rather than analytic, which means they are not necessary truths. The subject does not contain the predicate. Uh, review an earlier video uh, if you liked for a more, uh, more extended definition of these terms. Kant says non-necessary truths which are believed independently of experience are still good. These fundamental principles by which we learn about the world from experience are not themselves drawn from experience, but they're not merely a product of instinct, as Hume says. They are also, well, they're the synthetic a priori beliefs Kant is talking about, and we would need a lot of time to talk about Kantian epistemology. Let me just um, try to give you a very brief illustration of what else Kant says. Kant says, um, Kant says that when you're looking at your screen here, you can tell that these, these brown Augustine books are behind me and uh, the teacup is currently in front of me, well, you're, you're seeing three dimensions, but you're actually looking at a perfectly flat two-dimensional screen. So you're seeing two dimensions, but understanding in three. Knowledge of three-dimensional space doesn't come from your perception in this case. It, in fact, organizes your perception. You get a two-dimensional perception, just a flat arrangement of colors, but your mind knows how to take the idea of three-dimensional space and interpret that perception and understand that, uh, in reality, outside of your perceptions and past your computer screen, uh, and in the fact of the matter where I was recording this video in the real world, there was a teacup in front of me and books behind me, as well as these uh, two dimensions up, down, uh, left, right. I'm in three-dimensional space. You know that, or at any rate, you believe that. <laughs> But the, the belief does not come from experience. It interprets experience. And in Kant's um, psychology, Kant's study of the way the human mind works, he finds that these principles, and he studies several of them, uh, not just the three causality, induction, uniformity of nature Hume's interested in here, but uh, a whole host of, of these statements. These principles are a necessary part of how we perceive the world. And not only... Are you unable to, uh, not only is it rational to keep believing them, but you don't have any choice. I got these some time ago uh, thinking, I'm going to use this as an illustration of class, and here I am using it on this long video instead, because since then I just haven't happened to have been assigned to teach a class where I could have spent enough time on Kant. But these principles that do not come from experience by which we perceive the world are like sunglasses glued to your face. You can't see the world without them. That's Kant's um, psychological analysis of of these principles, his, his response to the Humean skepticism about ex-beliefs. Kant says something very similar. There are these beliefs about the world which are necessary for learning about the world from experience, which are themselves not derived from experience. And unlike Hume's skeptical solution, well, like Hume's skeptical solution, Kant says, yes, believe them, they're rational. But also, moving past Hume, improving on Hume, um, at least as Kant sees it, though I tend to agree, Kant says, well, they're not just necessary and useful, but they're perfectly rational. And you can't even perceive the world without them. These are the pink sunglasses glued to your face. Belief in causality, uniformity of nature, induction, and three-dimensional space 
is how you perceive the world. You cannot see the world without your eyes, and it's crazy to try, and you can't perceive the world without these principles, and it'd be crazy to try. Don't be a human <laughs> skeptic or any other kind of skeptic. That's an extremely brief introduction to the Kant version. Again, pink sunglasses glued to your face is what these principles are in Kant. Another alternative is Thomas Reed, who says, well, we know these principles by common sense. And I don't think Hume, I don't think Reed disagrees with Hume on the idea that belief in these principles is an instinct. But Reed seems to think, eh, these, these instincts are a source of knowledge. Now, how can an instinct be a source of knowledge? That question is answered not so much by Thomas Reed as by Alvin Plantinga who finishes the job. Hume dis makes this discovery about ex-beliefs and beliefs that are necessary for learning about the world from experience, which are themselves not derived from experience, so how do we get them? Hume says, making a great accomplishment in philosophy, discovering that there are such beliefs. Hume says, eh, we don't know, but it's a good instinct, so keep on believing it. Kant says, eh, it's a necessary part of how we perceive the world, like sunglasses glued to your face, and don't try to believe without them. You can't anyway. And Kant says some other great stuff about these beliefs, which he classifies as synthetic a priori beliefs. Reed says, we believe these things by common sense. And Planiga, Alvin Planiga, a more recent philosopher, comes along and says, this is, I think, the year 2000. This is much more recent. Uh, no, 93. The third book in this trilogy was uh, the year 2000. In 93, Planning Guy and Warrington Proper Function explains how an instinct can be a source of knowledge. Briefly, knowledge is what you get when a belief is true and it's warranted. And a warranted belief is one which is produced by faculties which are designed for knowing the world and their faculties working properly in the right environment. Um, make sure I got all that right. Um, their faculties for knowing the world, they are designed for knowing the world, they are reliable, they are functioning properly, and they're functioning in the right environment. That kind of faculty ha creates an instinct to believe in these ex-beliefs, and that is how we know, according to Planiga's, um finishing to the project that Thomas Reed. So there's a very brief hint of some of the alternatives. If you're interested in this stuff and you've actually watched through to the end of this 20-something minute video, um, I strongly recommend looking at other stuff. I've got other things on this channel on the uh, Topics in Philosophy playlist, uh, even a Bertrand Russell video in the Articles in Contemporary Philosophy playlist. There's more on this channel on this subject, but this video has gone on quite long enough. So long.